Welcome back, everybody, to a, another episode of Two Guys in the Cloud. Bob, um, I feel like we've been on a bit of a hiatus. We have yeah. been. You know, we we hit it high with Gabriella, and then we just like <laughs> took took a long vacation for some reason. Yeah. But we're back at it. Yeah. yeah it was, it, we, I think both of us wanted to drop the mic, but then somebody sort of picked the mic back up and said, "No, you have to keep yeah, going." Keeps going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is Q4 for Microsoft, and so we know it's our busiest time of the year as well, right? So. Yeah, yes, that's 100% true, um, which actually makes uh, the appearance of our guest all the more welcome and, and we're grateful for it because we know it's a very busy time. Um, and today we're, we're very, very grateful to welcome Ryan as Dorian and uh, of the surface business at Microsoft. And I know that there's just a whole bunch that we're going to want to talk about in terms of Ryan, your role at Microsoft and your leadership of the surface business and you know, all of that as it relates to the cloud and, you know, we're, we'll connect the dots there. But, you know, first, just a really, really big thank you for joining us today. Again, we know it's a real busy time. Oh, hey, thank you for letting me join you guys. I'm actually incredibly honored to be uh, a guest after Gabriella. So thanks for picking the mic back up and letting me join <laughs> you guys. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, Ryan, I know that we gave you a bit of a, of a, you know, prep in terms of what is our typical approach here. And it, you know, and as you, as we told you, it's really turned out to be kind of a cool tradition yeah. here at Two Guys in the Cloud to just sort of ask our guests to give us their journey. Um, it, you know, the tech space has been this vast enterprise of growth for so many, you know, people. And how they got into the industry is typically not what you would think in there. And we've learned so much just in understanding how they've evolved. So I guess we're hoping to start the conversation there. If you wouldn't mind just helping us understand. I, yeah, I'd love it. And ask questions as I tell you, you know, my my history, uh, I, first of all, it starts from when I was a kid. And I've just been a computer nerd my whole life. Like, I've just loved computers. I remember uh, I, remember I used to go and teach my parents' uh, friends how to use DOS. Uh, that's kind of where I, I first started nerding out a little bit. And, um, you know, it was just, it, it was such a great uh, thing to get involved in. And I started, uh, I went to college at University of Florida, so I'm a Gator. And then I ended up being an intern at Microsoft. I was on the engineering side for a bit. And since college, I have basically been at Microsoft. I've had a roller coaster journey and it's ended up in just this, you know, explosion of great experiences. You know, I've been through uh, through Bill, Steve and now Satya and seen the company transform in just magical ways. But I started as an engineer. I was in office. I then um, I made a pivot. Actually, I went to the Microsoft advertising division right when they were starting, right when Microsoft yes. Ad Center started. Uh, you know, I was helping even I was on the sales and marketing side, but I was also helping with the engineering side. It was a really cool incubation time for Microsoft entering advertising. And so I got some really cool experience there. And then I jumped around and, you know, I know you talked about career development a little bit. Man, I just met a whole bunch of people through Microsoft and I made this jump into our Windows uh, business group division at the time. And it happened literally because someone emailed an alias I was on and said, hey, I'm hiring for this position. This is the job. It's playing with PCs and talking about how you know great PCs are and how we're going to you know, bring them to the next level. And I remember I, I emailed the, the gentleman and I said, uh, I'm not interested in changing jobs. I'm so happy. Uh, I got this great job. But man, this sounds cool. I'd love to just grab coffee and catch up. And we ended the coffee with him telling me I was going to interview. And I was, <laughs> and I did. And next thing you know, you know, it all kind of played out. I did uh, this Windows uh, business group area. I had this really cool experience where I got to be on stage with uh, Steve Ballmer at CES when Microsoft had the keynote. And I uh, got this cool exposure. I was kind of the demo guy. Um, and, you know, I, I always tell people so young in their career go be the demo person. It's the best, like you learn so much. And so I did that. I went to our OEM division. I then went to our developer division. Uh, I then had one of the coolest jobs I've had uh, right when Satya became CEO. 
uh, I worked in his office, you know, we call office of the CEO and I was um, his basically technical advisor. And we spent a whole bunch of time uh, as, as he took on the company and just his incredible leadership. I got to have a firsthand seat in watching that. Uh, I learned more from that role than probably all my roles combined. And I'd say I didn't even realize I was learning it at the time. It's like just the exposure. And then um, I jumped over to the UK and uh, I ended up working in the UK for two and a half years. I was the same role I'm in now. I was the Surface a Business Group lead. So I looked over the Surface Commercial Division in the UK and then I had the opportunity to say, hey, let me go take what I learned and go do it uh, back in the U.S. So I moved to the U.S. Here I am and uh, getting to speak to you guys. And that's what I've been doing the last couple of years. Perfect. Gosh, that was great. Thank you. I And as you were talking, I had all these thoughts, but I didn't want to interrupt. But I want to reel it back because, I, yeah, you know, let's just, go back. I tried. I tried to be quick. <laughs> yeah, no, it was really good. I I want to start. Okay, so I want to start by talking about DOS, which is I love the fact that you started there because I immediately had this, you know, flashback to my own, you know, childhood and yeah. my first experience. And I'm going to reference my first computer being an Apple II Plus, not to, you know, throw yeah. other brands out there or anything like that. Yeah. But that was where my journey started and learning how to, you know, write. And I think it was basic back then, you know, and it was and I never became a full on engineer, but it was how I learned. That's how I fell in love with the whole thing was learning how to, you know, it sounds silly, but to put colors on the screen and to assemble the colors so that you had a picture. And then and then, you know, I remember, did you have the the monitor that it had that like push in button? And I remember there were four colors on mine and it just like, it, all it did was change the color of the text yeah. and it was beautiful. Yeah, yeah, I, it, it was in, in I, exactly. And I remember getting to this moment in time where then, um, what was it, War Games came out yeah. uh, with Matthew Broderick. I don't know if you remember yeah. that. And yeah. then it was like, I was done, you know, like at that point. And uh, then I remember just trying to write, <laughs> write a program to be like War Games, which, was no more different than putting a yes, no, and then flipping out the, the menu afterwards. But, you know, it's funny how that, like, that's how it all started. Like you fall in love and then you're just sort of in it from that point I, on. I remember, you know, convincing my dad, I, I remember going through like 286, 386, 486 computers. And I remember telling my dad, we were just talking about this recently, when I was like trying to convince him, I think it was like to buy an eight megabyte hard drive. And I was like, eight megabytes. We're going to have the biggest hard drive. We'll, like, we'll never have to worry about it again. So, yeah, yeah pretty fun. It's, it's crazy. And then, you know, I mean, just so much goes from there. But I love that you started there. I thought that was that was awesome. And then, you know, as you're unfolding these tremendous experiences in your career, it's it's a very cool journey. And I love the, I, the, the Satya chapter. That just sounds like, gosh, I, I would have had a hard time not just just being very quiet and just listening and hoping to absorb as much as you did. Well, that's what you end up doing in, you know, some of these uh, staff roles. And uh, I really had two. I, I was a communications manager and then I was also a uh, and then the technical advisor role. And in both of them, you know, you're contributing. But I, you know, I always tell people go experiencing these staff roles because you you, you really in all of them, you own nothing, but you get to influence everything. And mm -hmm. that is such a powerful way to learn that, you know, there's just no comparison. Yeah, yeah, that's a great way to put it too. And I, I bet a bit liberating, you know, in the sense that without the ownership, you know, you don't have that, I don't wanna say, I'm gonna use the word like hammer over you, but you know, it's like the, it, it probably provides a bit of, bandwidth to just absorb and be very thoughtful and not have that sort of pressure tied to a number. Um, that must be pretty cool. <laughs> I don't yeah, remember that anymore. <laughs> you get to you get to see it and understand it. And that gives you such context for, you know, now as I look over the surface business, I have a lot more context and understanding. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Having a relationship with the CEO probably doesn't hurt either, right? <laughs> It, you know, it was, um, it's always interesting also the, the external perception, not external to Microsoft, just like external perception to working in one of those offices. 
Um, you obviously you do, you know, build that relationship. Uh, but what you're really doing is building the professional side of that relationship is something so invaluable to have that exposure. It it ends up being about like understanding. I'm a big believer in everyone's leadership as a manager, as a leader, as, as all of that comes from seeing lots of different leaders in your career and life shape that and taking the good pieces and, you know, maybe pushing away some of the pieces you didn't like. And I think that's one of the things that's really shaped me as a leader to say, what experiences did I watch other people do? The, you know, the, the inclusiveness and, and the way I saw Satya lead and bring people together. And not only Satya, some other really, really fantastic leaders at Microsoft. That's what ended up shaping how I really think about approaching a team, a squad, a, you know, a whole organization. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, Ryan, I actually, I take a lot of that from my time at Microsoft as well, because um, you, you, you're exposed to a lot of different leaders at Microsoft, right, in a lot of different roles. And you're right, um, there's stuff you take and there's the stuff you say, you know what, I didn't love that part, right? And and, and you move that away. And it's, uh, it's, it's really important and it's kind of, as I've gone up in leadership roles, have taken a lot of that, those learnings is, is really so important as, as you know, that you're, you're building a management style as, as you move forward. So I couldn't agree more. And I've always thought about my time at Microsoft that way. Yeah. Um, one of the things I'm really interested in that you mentioned in your background is the move to the UK. Um, I, you know, when I was over there, I always thought like right after school, I would have loved to come over here and work for a couple of years. And I know you probably did a more, you know, more mid career, but tell me what, what that was like. Cause obviously that's a, that's a big move and a pretty cool one uh, to, to do yeah. something like that. I, you know, the, you, you pull on my heartstrings asking that question because it's such a special time, such a special experience. I, I tell people that I am not only a better employee from it, I am a better human being. And I just genuinely mean that the the melting pot of the world that London is and the experiences I got, uh, not to mention my wife and I uh, both went over there. She also works at Microsoft. So we had this great experience of us both going over there, experiencing that. We had our first child over there. We have two kids now. You know, we got such an experience of traveling around, experiencing the culture. And we also were there through Brexit. Um, you know, we got... We had a lot of worldly experiences, if you will, by going over there and seeing what it means and, and seeing also what is the difference uh, between how a company can be run globally, but also, you know, many companies have a central function, a central headquarters, and then they've got some series out there. And I think there's pros and cons to every you know way that different companies are managed, but you get to see some of the way that works. And that was really the experience there and one of the things i remember my uh my first manager over there uh said to me if you know some of the listeners are familiar with uh you know the differences in culture and, and all of that i would say i'm a generally uh I, i'm generally an extrovert generally a bit louder and and i remember when i went over there uh i, I tried to adapt myself to the culture that was in the UK. And I remember uh, my manager, who was a great leader, she said to me, she said to, the, she said to me, I didn't hire you to adapt to our culture. I hired you to help us make, make all of us better. I want you to bring your full self, I want you to be yourself, and I want you to make us all better and bring the fresh eye perspective that you can. And I have to say, it was one of the most liberating comments I could receive to say, I get to show up at work with who I am. I get to, you know, help influence the business and I get to really be the leader that I want to be. And that was so powerful. Yeah, that's really that cool. Sounds that way. Yeah, and I agree with 100% on the melting pot term as it relates to London. You know, I, I, I'm a huge fan. My, my son went to school there for half a year and I got to visit him a couple of times, you know, because of work, but then to spend time with him and, I too, you know, just became very attached to that experience and just that 
that city. I mean, it's just a tremendous city. So I, I get all that. I'm, I'm very curious. So as I'm thinking and reflecting on your your last set of comments about your your leadership observations and then being overseas, I, I'm wondering, you know, if you had to define your leadership philosophy, you know, and I, and I just I'm always curious because, you know, everybody's got their own little kind of prism on what they perceive to be their own leadership philosophy. I'm fascinated. What, how would you kind of articulate your stamp on leadership? Yeah, you know, I I basically have this mantra, if you will, of the things that you you do in an organization. Um, and it's really about, um, uh, you know, energy, generating energy, um, uniting people. As you bring that together and you and, and you unite people, then you kind of move into the agitate stage, um, and then you move into the creative stage, and then you repeat that. So you really have you know this uh, energy unite, agitate, create, repeat, and you you have this cycle that lets people bring everything when everything's you know a bit mixed up, but then as you find that rhythm you move forward. And I, the reason I am really passionate about also the agitate and create stages is because, you know, in technology, especially, everything is changing so often. And so how do you keep the business fresh, the work fresh, the people fresh? And, and so that's part of the magic. And in all of that, I think part of what I try to do really hard is make sure I'm empowering, uh, folks to find their own and 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 build their own you know i i'd say i'm very anti micromanagement uh but also i mean in some ways it's it's even about obviously roles and responsibilities and clarity there becomes important as you you want to create that clarity but i also leave a little bit uh of ambiguity to make sure people can also find it themselves and so um, i'll say to my team often I won't give you the clear exact swim lanes. I'll try and point you in the pool, but I want you to also kind of go build that um, and help us see uh, see the swim lanes ourselves. Yeah, yeah, no, fascinating. I, I could see the circle as you were describing it, you know, just the whole, you know, every one of your stages and how they sort of build on each other and then, you know, kind of going over again, that's cool. And it's it's neat when it, as individuals, we develop our own philosophies and thought processes and, you know, and then we tweak them over time because we learn, you know, nothing should stay still, you know, and that's that's pretty cool. So let me ask this in your current charter, you know, right now, um, what, what's the what's the focus? Like, help me understand, you know, what you're focused on right now with the service business and what you're trying to accomplish using that leadership methodology. Yeah, well, the first thing, you know, I'd say is. I feel very, uh, very lucky to have this job in service because if you think about that career path I described, it really kind of speaks to all the things that I love and I'm passionate about. And, you know, I've, I've always thought of surface as not just the PC, but a way to bring the best of Microsoft, a way to bring innovation. Uh, the innovation piece is what really powers me. Um, and helps me think about our own mission, empowering people and organizations, because it's about how do you lead the entire ecosystem on the technology piece to say what's new. And I think about things like, you know, facial recognition and, you know, the depth camera that was needed for that. And really, you know, with Surface Pro 4, Surface Book 1, we led the market with that. And now it's hard to find a PC that doesn't have that. Uh, when you think about tools like autopilot bringing the best of microsoft 365 again something that surface really led with and now the whole ecosystem uh you know brings that forward so it's really about what are all these pieces of technology those are two examples there's many examples where you you start with the art of the possible the magic of hardware and software together right you can build anyone can build incredible hardware when you bring that hardware and software together, the magic is making the technology invisible. I mean, even even you and I, all the three of us talking right now, this experience in HD with great sound and you know remote remote places, working through the pandemic, that wasn't possible. It was possible to some extent, but the quality and the interaction to make us feel 
like we are together is incredible. I mean, behind me, you kind of see I've got a Surface Hub here as well. And that's, you know, one of the things we've done is try to think about things like where do the eyes look? How does it make us feel like we are having a, you know, intimate conversation and we're doing the best we can? It's very hard to replace real in-person experiences, but the better the magic of the hardware and software together, where that comes together, that's the magic. That's what I'm after. Of course, we'd like to sell lots and lots of Surface devices, and I'm focused on that, but I'm really focused on the magic we can drive in the ecosystem and how we get everyone across all of our PC vendors, you know, building this experience for our customers. That's the matter. That's that's Windows. That's not just Surface. That's Windows. Surface is a mechanism to bring that to life. Yeah. So Ryan, I've got a great. Well, I don't know how. Great I'm pretty it is. passionate about that question. By the it, way, no, it, it's no. it's a great answer. Great answer. <laughs> it's great. So so guys, I have a um, a story about Surface, and yeah. as Ryan knows, and I'm sure Elliot does as well. There was a time that Microsoft said they were not a hardware company, right? It, we were software only, you know, that's what yep. we did, right? Not a hardware company. But um, Surface, when it first came out, was the size of a dining room table, um, almost like a huge video game, right? And it was big. And I was managing, uh, here's a UK connection, uh, Reed Elsevier at the time. And Reed Elsevier's largest uh, U.S. was uh, sub was LexisNexis, and they had a what they considered a sensitive information group, and um, they wanted to see Surface, and they wanted to see it in D.C. So I was going out there to show them Surface, and we had it set up at an MTC in, in D.C., and the night before was a gigantic snowstorm. Um, in DC. So I called the people at the MTC, are you even going to be there? And I called the client, the client said, yeah, we can make it there. So I, I hopped on a plane that morning, drove in, and we did a, a surface demo. Uh, there, were, there were three people in the entire MTC, me, the client, and the person demoing it on this huge, you know, device. Um, and uh, they actually ended up buying three of them, I think. So it, w it was a successful sale and a w worthwhile trip. But what was interesting is they were going to use it for um, child location. Because any time a child is taken or missing, I guess like 90% is of um, a family member has done it. So what they were able to do, and they wanted to do it on the surface, was be able to, once that happened, be able to map where all of their uh, family members are so that a police person could go visit every one of the locations. So um, that was, boy, back in the day, but that was uh, that was quite a a big surface and surface yeah. has really come a long way. And, and to Microsoft's credit, they have done a hell of a job, you know, from that time to uh, producing a really great, um, you know, device now which wasn't so great the first time it came out, but it has really morphed into an excellent, excellent device. I, I tell you, I, I love that story. It is it is the reason I am passionate about what we do. We talk about empowering people and organizations. The, the, the story you just told about the use cases, right? It is about the use cases. We I remember a couple of years ago we had, uh, I believe it was the Surface 3 version that they were using in hospitals uh to manage heart conditions in children like these are the stories that make a difference um you know that that really tell why we do what we do and that's that's why we're here we're here to to do things with technology that were not possible to do even a few years ago and if we keep pushing that innovation needle every single year which is what we are after that is where the magic stories come to life and we change the world. Absolutely. And I, and I kind of think that that's, you know, along the way, I've, I've been thinking about this, you know, the market competition between Surface and Apple, you know, in the sense that it, at this point, 
you know, there was a moment in time where, you know, the iPad and that that Apple device was fairly dominant. And then and it had a real clear positioning statement within, I would say, the consumer segment. Right? And then I would I would argue that Surface and what is the Surface family grew up in a more corporate private component. But today, a lot of that stuff's blended. You know, I mean, the, you know, they're, what's corporate, what's personal anymore? I mean, I work from home all the time now. You know, I mean, it's it, it's very, very blended. And as I think about then how do we, how does the Surface story differentiate itself from its com competition? I think it does it through exactly what you just described, which is the, it's more about the use case. It's more, and it's more, it's not about the hardware. It's about the solution in terms of the coupling of, and you mentioned it before, the hardware and the software, the hardware and the cloud, right? And it's the ultimate outcome. And I think that's turned out to be a really great end state for the Surface brand in all of these things. Um, and I don't know how much of that was planned. I don't know how much of it was just the way it worked out, but I reflect on where the brand started and where it is today. And if it feels like it's in a very good, strong place right now um, in yep. terms of its position in the marketplace, but I'm not living it. I mean, is that a fair assessment or what, you know, what would no, you say? I, I think it is, you know, we, we say also our products are a reflection of the people that make them, but it's also the people that use them. And one of the things that I think about is we started, even the Surface business started with more of a consumer brand. And you said, was that plan, the, the cloud tie-in, you know, things like autopilot, you know, how we're building our, you know, chip to cloud security uh, across Surface. Like, was it planned? Probably not 10 years ago when Surface started, but it was planned as we listened to what our customer needs were. Um, and that is what continues to fuel all of the things that we move forward with around Surface to think about what does what does the future need to look like? How do we bring in the cloud? And, and in many ways, you know, if you say, hey, it's, it's the hardware, the software, the services, all of that together. In many ways, I want the device to be as invisible as possible to the user because when it's feels invisible obviously it's still there but it means that that magic part is happening and that's part of what we're trying to build yeah no cool cool answer um i can have I, a question. can i double click on that real quick Elliot? yeah all, so, all good. so ryan i'm gonna date myself i i was at the uh tablet pc launch for microsoft when yeah. Microsoft would launch a new product and it would be like, you know, they they get a assembly hall and hand out T-shirts and rock and roll and be everything like that. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, the tablet PC didn't do great. And then shortly after that, the iPad came out. Right. And yeah. everyone's like, I love the iPad. And I kept saying, well, Microsoft had that five years ago. It was called the tablet PC. Yeah. And, you know, it, it was interesting at that time that I really thought. Um, Microsoft took a commercial, professional kind of approach to the tablet PC, and it wasn't a great fit at the time, right? Yeah. And then the iPad took more of the consumer fit, and they really obviously exploded there. And I, I, I see with the Surface is Microsoft really had some learnings watching both of those scenarios. Yeah. And that's why I think the Surface is so good today is because you were able to have the learning, you know, what Apple was doing well and what the technology we had. Th that tablet PC was a very good PC. It yep. was just wasn't ready for the market. And the market was ready, you know, a few years later and in, in, in the, you know, public side. So it to me, it's been a really nice match between the two. You probably remember like I do, you know, I, I, I had a, I think my first one, I think it was a, Toshiba Tekra M4 yeah. uh, that, you know, it, it opened up and flipped around. <laughs> and, <came> around. <laughs> yes. and, and so, uh, no, I remember all that. I also remember at the time, you know, I had an all-in-one that had optical touch instead of yep. capacitive touch. It pressure sensitive touch. You had all these different versions of touch. And if you think about the, the magic we were talking about, the magic that you now have on capacitive touch on you know, pens that understand tilt and, you know, palm recognition and all of these technologies. At the time when we 
all first had those uh, tablet PCs, if you will, convertibles, all of that. That technology was not at a place where it felt like magic. It worked and it worked yep. very well. But there was a difference between and there's a difference today when I write on my pro device it feels like I am writing on paper. It didn't feel that way before. Right. And it is it is the things that, you know, maybe we don't think about, but yeah, can your screen tell the difference between your palm versus the pen? And yeah. those are the things that are, are that magic that our learnings through the years, all of those little bits and pieces, those are all the pieces of, of technology that make the magic. That's yeah. right. Let, let, let's pivot a little bit. Um, yeah. you know, one of the challenges that I, I just imagine all the time in your role and in Microsoft's strategy in general is this tension between what I would call the partner ecosystem and your you know, strategic imperative to create a, a best outcome or a best experience for the marketplace, right? So, you know, Surface became a very deliberate decision to bring hardware into development within Microsoft, understanding that there's a partner ecosystem that's going to be competing against it. And, you know, obviously that's being done to create the best outcome for the customer and, and the market, of course. But in doing that, you know, you have this balancing act, right, in terms of, you know, you need to support your partner ecosystem, but at the same time, leverage and create intellectual property for your own product line. How do you walk that line? I, I have to believe that that's a very, very difficult balancing act. Yeah, you know, we we have very close partners, obviously, HP, Dell, Lenovo, other OEMs that support our Windows business. And, you know, I, I said kind of in my history of being at the company, uh, one of the places I was early in my career for a long time was not only the Windows division, but the OEM division. And so I've worked very closely with our OEMs and I understand their business and I think they're amazing companies. And so it is it is really critical to think about how do we support their businesses, our business at the same time. And this is why I go to the innovation place. And I tell my team internally at Microsoft this too, like, we are partners with all of those, the, with all of those companies. We are about how we build the Windows ecosystem. And this is where it really ties to the modern work strategy that we're doing for customer outcomes. It ties to how you deliver the best experience on Teams as we get to experience, how we get to experience all of those things that customers need. That is really where the focus is. The, the hardware is a vehicle to bring the innovation. And HP, Lenovo, and Dell, and others bring incredible innovation in different ways. One of the things that we do and you know we're passionate about is making sure we share the reference designs that we create. We share the IP that we uh, go and build. And so everything that is available for Surface, we do make available for our OEMs as well. So that you know it is it is one team that is really pushing Windows and Windows devices, and that is something that is really exciting. That's yeah, actually, I I really appreciate that last part. You know, the fact that you share your designs, you share the IP. I didn't know that. Uh, frankly, I didn't think that. You know, so I mean, the fact that you, you know Microsoft does share at that just level of granularity. It's a to me that's a tremendous testimony to Microsoft and its commitment, you know, to this uh, ecosystem economy. I mean, I think it's that's pretty remarkable in my in yeah. from my perspective. You know, one of the things we want to do is raise the entire industry, raise the entire ecosystem. Now, uh, will every company have their differentiated strategy? Of course, and you know, but I think that this is this is why I, I shared even at the beginning. Autopilot is one of the things I'm most passionate about, and especially through the pandemic, the way that you know you think about uh, moving from a place where you would get something completely configured, uh, you know, with a gold image and you know mailed out and all this stuff, use certificates and plugging into the network, you know, now with Autopilot, you basically get a PC, 
I get a new PC in the mail, you know, I, I play with a lot of PCs being in Surface, and I <laughs> type in my username, my password, I phone authenticate, and everything's brought down from the cloud. That was something that, you know, again, in, in the sharing of IP, like, we rolled out to the entire ecosystem. And we led, you know, Surface was one of the first uh, OEMs to pick up on the technology. But now if you look, every OEM uh, has autopilot functionality. You know, you guys implement a lot of that. And, and so this is one of, the, one of the, you know, small examples of how the mission is really about raising the entire ecosystem to go further together. Yeah, and that and that's a the autopilot story is just a perfect segue in terms of that connection between the cloud and the device, right? I mean that you know the entire concept behind autopilot is that it's facilitated via the cloud, yeah. And every you know, and and it's um, it is tremendous if you think about the business implications there. You know the fact that just from a logistics perspective, what it means. And first time somebody described it to me, I thought it, magic is a good word for it because you think. How did that happen? How did, yeah. how did it's fantastic? And then you reflect on how, <laughs> and that's that's pretty incredible too. It is. Yeah, Bob, I think you were about to ask something. I think I cut you off. I'm sorry. No, no, I I, I just so when Ryan said he gets a few PCs, I, I need to know how many laptops you have right now. I mean, literally, because you know I'm a sneakerhead. I got about a hundred pairs of sneakers. And I just got to imagine you've got PCs all over the house. I mean, it, it feels like there's one showing up on your doorstep, you know, a couple times a week, right? From uh, UPS. Uh, I, I don't think my wife would allow for a couple times a week. Uh, but, I, you know, I do, I do try and play with all the different lines, especially as we introduce new lines. And so, um, you know, I don't know. I, I probably have around about, about 10 PCs around the house right now. All right. Okay. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to over under that's many, low to me. I, I'm yeah, not as many as low. sneakers. <laughs> I did not know that, Bob Agno, that you're a sneakerhead. I yes, did not yes. I, I have a lot of sneakers. We could do a, a sneakerhead podcast if you like. <laughs> oh my gosh. So now I'm going to ask questions because I'm curious. So, what have you always been a sneakerhead, Bob? <laughs> um, I, 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 well, so yes, I mean, as a child, but you know, I, you couldn't afford so many there. So, um, we, um, you know, it's been something my, my son likes it as well. So we, we started kind of uh, collecting and get him into them. So it, it's, it's fun. It's an expensive hobby. That's for sure. I've heard but, that. Uh, I, I love my sneakers. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> Fantastic. I love that. So um, I guess, Brian, let me ask this, you know, if you think about the future a bit, right, you know, and I know that, at, at, you know, and anytime we have these discussions, we know that there are things that can't be said because of NDAs and so forth. But if you had to paint a picture for the folks that are listening in terms of what what the, you know, you know not just surface, but what the device experience may look like in the future and the kind of things that we think we're going to pull forward into those experiences, what would you describe? How would you paint that picture? I think one of the things that, um, you know, I, I've been describing it almost the entire talk, which has been great about becoming more invisible to the things that we want to accomplish. It's a, it's about the outcomes, right? And our video quality can get better. Our sound can get better. Our All these things can get better incrementally. Um, I think that when you start to add up all of the incrementals, the experience starts to revolutionize. You might you might miss it if you blink, uh, but if you then look back a couple years, you would think about our experience on video conferencing, uh, you know, a couple years ago versus today, and you'd be like, "Wow, that's changed so much." But you might not have seen it day by day, and I think that's part of you know the continued evolution and revolution of the PC industry. Uh, it's one of the things that continually keeps me excited. The PC has been around for a long time. What we can accomplish with the PC has changed tremendously. So that, you know, that's where I think about what can we do more? And I would say at Microsoft, you know, one of the things that I am constantly focused on is the solutions across everything we do with Microsoft 365, with Teams, 
If you think about, we have our dynamics business focused on business applications that run these major companies, tying into those in a deeper way, integrating with the pen and touch, and you know all of the gestures that that you know really bring this to life. And you even think about you know Azure and where we're really going with uh, virtualization and virtual desktop and all of these different technologies that come together. Those are products and technologies. But again, if you add up all of the incremental pieces, the hope is, and my hope is, a couple of years from now, when you look back, you'll say, wow, what a revolution we've seen. But you might miss it if you look every single day. Yeah, no, that makes sense. What about the bridge between you know, surface and, and I'm going to say whole lens or hollow lens or the virtual reality? Is there a bridge? Is there not a bridge? You know, I, I find myself getting into this sort of spiral thought process around that. You know, they feel separate, but I, God, they, I kind of believe that one day they may get connected. What do you what do you think about that? Yeah, it's it's a good question. And, you know, I don't have a crystal ball on that one, but, you know, I obviously there's a hardware connection from Microsoft as, as a starting place. You know, there is a base level of Windows bringing that all together. I think what really we have to see is the way people will use mixed reality, augmented reality technology to accomplish what they need. And there's some really amazing use cases. They're very focused uh, today, but you think about, you know, there's some scenarios around remote assist and the way you can help someone on a ma manufacturing floor. Now, if you think about the outcome, I love to think about, especially let's take that manufacturing floor. I'll just riff on that for a second. You've got, you know, an information worker, maybe at their Surface Studio at their desktop and they're, they're building plans. You've got someone else on the manufacturing floor with a Surface Hub and, you know, they're collaborating on it. It's also available in 85 inch version. Uh, you know, they're collaborating on this big screen on, on the manufacturing floor, drawing with the pens, getting the schematics, getting the information from, you know, maybe the information worker, you know, that's drafting it on their studio. You've got someone on their Surface Book, and they've got this, you know, discrete GPU-powered, uh, you know, device that's calculating all these things in real time. And next to them, you've got somebody that's getting remote help from a different country that's showing them and seeing what they're seeing as they do, you know, engine repair, engine creation, and something, you know, that is physical, the physical world, and they're showing them how to do it. And that's just the manufacturing floor. When you think about the implications this could have for healthcare. I mean, my mind starts to go wild with think about the expertise that can be shared across the world between doctors, between surgeons, nurses, and you can share that information. You can bring technology also to remote areas that may not have all the technology infrastructure. But if you can bring that power in through a device and make it feel like magic, you have brought that technology to a new set of people. That is, you know, that's a tie. And again, you get me excited on the vision, but like, that's the future. Yeah, yeah, no, it's cool. It's all really cool stuff. And one of the reasons I think we're all in technology is that, you know, it, it really never stops. It always is evolving. You know, it really challenges us, is, you know, challenges us to be creative and to explore the unknown. It's, it keeps it fresh, you know, which is, I think, the part that feeds the passion, which is really cool. It is. Yeah. So, Bob, I think that we're coming very close to time. We are. I, yeah. I just want to make sure. a great conversation. Yeah. I mean, Ryan, Ryan, just put a bow on what you said, right? They, we've gone from those desktop, you know, $25,000 a pop, right, things to, yeah. to really great PCs. So whatever comes next, I'm sure is going to be equally great. So thanks again for the time today. I really appreciate it. It was my pleasure. It was really, really uh, great to talk to you guys. You get me fired up by talking about the technology. We took a little <laughs> trip down memory lane. So thank you guys for the time. Everything that you guys do as well. It, it, you know, us working together is really what powers the industry. And um, I just want to say thank you for you guys making the time and doing what you do. Thanks, Ryan. All right, man.